Reading, of course, from the authorized version of the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 19. Today is the 19th. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures, commonly called the King James Version, and follow me along in the scriptures that we will be reading today. Okay? Don't just sit there passively. Get a copy of the scriptures, the authorized version, known as the King James Version. Get that, open it up, follow me along in the scriptures that we will look at today, okay? Proverbs chapter 19, verses 20 on to verse 23. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. The desire of a man is his kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. And remember... In Job chapter 28, verse 28, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord tendeth to life. If you fear the Lord, you're going to depart from evil, okay? He is going to guide you in accordance with the scriptures of how you should live and what you should do, and more importantly, what you should believe. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. See, Paul talks about having food and raiment therewith. Let us be content, because we brought nothing into this world, and it is most certain that we will take nothing out. Naked came we out into this world, and naked we're going to return hither. Okay? But when you are of the church of the living God, saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus, our Lord will satisfy you with himself. Because, see, what is lacking in you is the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. That uh, circumcision made without hands that seal until the day of redemption. There are many out there who uh, call themselves Christians, but yet they don't have Christ. They have that spirit of Antichrist, but they do not have God himself living within them. Hmm. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And see... Looking at verse 23, the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Okay? He shall not be visited with evil. See, when you fear the Lord, this, that, and the things that arrive from that are not going to satisfy you. Now, for example, the things that come from that, meaning the world, food, okay, sustenance to pay bills and that kind of stuff, yes, but the deep satisfaction, that yearning, that groaning can only be filled by Jesus Christ. But see, Satan, through the government that he controls, through the media that he controls, through other things that he controls, through his church, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and her army, the Jesuit order, they tell you, they want you to be satisfied by the things that Satan gives. And see, because of that, my wife and I personally, we have 
we have encountered many people, many people who, um, who when you talk to them and you tell them about what's going on, a lot of people, I would say about 60% of the people, when you bring up to them that it's the Jesuits that are in control of the government, that the Jesuits have brought on this psychological operation known as the Poison Crown, and others, which we are going to be addressing today, um, that the Jesuits are responsible. The government here in America, the government in your nation, which is run by the Jesuit order, they are responsible for what is happening today. About 60% of the people that we run into scoff at that idea. <laughs> the government's not... Who? The what? The Jesuits? What? And those uh, other 40% that, so, oh yeah, I believe the government. But, see, the thing is with that, here in America, we just, we just need Trump to come back. <laughs> we, we need to vote these people out of office. <laughs> uh, listen. And Church of the Living God, brothers and sisters, hi, we love you. Please continue to pray for us. And brothers and sisters, thank you so very much. Every single one of you, you know who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep us in your prayers. Things are not getting better. At this moment, they are not getting worse but they're not getting better. There are good days and there are bad days. Please keep us in your prayers. But brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God, this, this video again is not directly aimed toward you. This is aimed toward you lost people. Okay? This is aimed toward you people, the lost. Um... <laughs> Your vote doesn't count. The government is against you. The government doesn't care about you. The government, as run by the Jesuit order, wants to kill you. It's all about uh, depopulating the world because the less people in the world, the easier they will be to control. Hence, depopulation. Depopulation. From the steel of the Jesuit poniard, to the poison crown. Look up the words poison and crown in Latin. You'll figure it out, okay? Th to the poison crown psychological operation created and instituted by the Jesuit order, okay? It's about depopulation. Getting, killing as many people as they can so there will be less people to be here on the earth when we, the Church of the Living God, get caught up and that man of sin, the son of perdition, be established, be revealed, okay? Less people, easier for him to control, okay? And you may scoff at that. People, you lost people. This is not in regards to the Church of the Living God. And even you devil coadjutors know this for certain, obviously because you're working for them. Okay. You know this. So this actually, you devils who have made your choice and made yourselves an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, you are my enemy because you have made yourself enemies to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. But even you know this is the case. And you lost people. You, you need to get your head out from betwixt your buttocks and wake up. You really do. You really, really do. You really do. Because, like I said, about 60% of the people that we run into, they, the government is not... We trust the government. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Has, has the government ever done anything like created something like a disease, a biological weapon, to reduce the population of a populace? <laughs> Thank you, Park.
Hmm? Has, have they ever done that before? Hmm? You look up the um, biological warfare that the Nazis were um, looking into. Look into Japan and their use of radioactive fleas. Radioactive fleas. But is it possible that a government could create, the Jesuit order through a government could create a biological weapon, throw the stamp of a virus on it or a disease, and then let it go? A lot of you out there scoff at that. You think this, No, no, that's fantasy. Oh, dear friends. You know, there was a Hollywood movie called Outbreak that had Dustin Hoffman, Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, Morgan Friedman, Kevin Spacey, and Donald Sutherland. I remember this, unfortunately. But that was a movie about a biological weapon created by the government that got out through a monkey. I don't recommend watching Hollywood movies, but if you've ever seen that, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, there again, predictive programming through the media. Hey, you lost people, here in America especially. Isn't it strange that it seems like the Simpsons are prophesying onto you people? How is that possible? Could it be they're following a script? But see, that other 40% that are, are aware that, yeah, the government through the Jesuit order are doing some uh, things like that. But instead of going to the head of the snake, which is the Jesuit order, Roman Catholicism, Satan, they go to the distraction, the Illuminati, the Masons, see. See, they'll, they'll give all their attention on to the distraction, which is the Illuminati and the Masons. Okay. Yes, the Illuminati and the Masons are being used by the Jesuit order as their front group for this specific purpose for some of you out there to put your focus on them rather than on the Jesuit order. See, Satan is a master of distraction. Okay. Another way that Satan will use distraction through certain agents, not just um, Jesuits and their coadjutors, those who work for the Vatican and the Jesuit order, for example, Fritz Springmeier, ever heard of him? He did a lot of work on stuff about the Illuminati. I personally believe that a majority of what Fritz Springmeier talked about, look him up, um, he did a documentary called, the, or a book, The Bloodlines of the Illuminati. A lot of his stuff is distraction disinformation to get your attention away from where it ought to be. Another one, John Stockwell, a former CIA agent. Okay, I'm going to put a link in the video of this video of something where John Stockwell is talking. Okay, uh, a CIA agent who revealed truth, but also is an agent of disinformation. So, like, for example, if you listen to something from Fritz Springmeier or John Stockton, you, you got to take it with a grain of salt. You really got to be like, okay, sound interesting, but you need to do your own labor and check them out, okay? But with all that said, what you are looking at is um, something on the thing of the disease AIDS, we're not talking about the poison crown or the steel of the Jesuit poniard. We're going to be talking a little bit about the disease called AIDS. AIDS. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. A while ago, before the poison crown operation instituted by the Jesuit order, you could find an, ex an, an exquisite, exquisite, documentary on AIDS that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that AIDS is a man-made created virus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Unfortunately, 
with the Poison Crown psychological operation. YouTube and Google through the redoing of their algorithms and stuff like that has long expunged the evidence that specific documentary that was about AIDS. I thought for a moment that I had found it on other platforms, like other ones that are similar to YouTube that uh, have a lot less uh, censorship. I thought I had found it, but it wasn't the, the one that um, that I had. I never downloaded it or else it would be on my channel, okay? Or on this channel, big part. But the evidence of it has been expunged. But see, they haven't gotten rid of everything. Now, what we're going to be looking at hardly does, does hardly prove that AIDS is a man-made disease. But it's going to plant into you a seed that maybe you will wake up a little bit and think of the impossible. That our Jesuit-controlled government was responsible for it. And you're going to see a lot of similarities here about how they're putting distraction when they did, when they came out with AIDS as to the poison crown psychological operation of today. You're going to see quite a few certain things, okay? But with that said, let's go ahead and watch this, okay? We are going to be going through some scriptures here, but this is, as you can see, this is only 2 minutes and 14 seconds. I downloaded these things, so if uh, YouTube decides to erase them, I already have them as evidence, okay? But, let's go ahead and watch this. Now, this has a robot voice, and this is quite dated, about 5 or 6 years ago, or 7 years ago, something like that. But, um, yeah, pay attention. Back in 1976, an advertisement Oops, began sorry, appearing. Wait, 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 let's go to the beginning. Back in 1976, an advertisement began appearing in New York newspapers. It stated, Last chance for gay men to join the hepatitis B vaccine program. Hepatitis B is a sexually transmitted disease. It also quoted that enrollment closes in June, after which the vaccine may not be available for several years. Take the free blood. So, you got to get this vaccine now, 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 because after a while, it won't be there. So, pushing people to get the vaccine for this hepatitis, whatever, okay? Pay attention. Blood test to determine your hepatitis B status and eligibility for the program. Over a thousand gay men took the free vaccination at a time when there was no such disease as AIDS. Then, by 1978, the infection began popping up all over the gay community. Strangely enough, it was predominate among the volunteers who had taken the free hepatitis B vaccine. Within five years, 60% of these men were infected with HIV. The program had been repeated the next year in San Francisco and Los Angeles, and as in New York, shortly after the vaccination for hepatitis B, the West Coast volunteers also began presenting with symptoms of AIDS. In Africa, in 1977, a free vaccination against smallpox was... Isn't that something? Bill Gates of hell? I, you, I like that thumbnail. Look at that thumbnail. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, um, as he does, he likes to test his stuff on you poor Hamites. And we know that it's a fact that Mr. Bill Gates of hell, that he does that, that he does his testing on those of the kindred of Ham. It's offered to the black citizens of the countries with population problems. The cost was borne by the United States Health Agencies as a humanitarian gesture. Again, within five years, over 60% of the recipients presented with the HIV virus and today well over 20 million face death from AIDS. There are some who say that the AIDS virus originated from the Hillman Green Monkeys of Africa. 
Of course, there is never any explanation as to how the virus then got from these damn little green monkeys in Africa into the blood of the East and West Coast gay males. And, no word as to what the supposedly AIDS-infected monkeys were doing between 1960 and 1978. The kidneys were being used for vaccine manufacture. Where in the world did the AIDS virus hide all during that time? Did United States of America try to create a biological warfare by means of population control a genocide? Comment your views and opinion. Subscribe to our channel for more interesting videos. Okay, that, that's it for that. Now, uh, do, I do beg your pardon, brethren. Yes, beg, uh, beg your pardon. Yes. Oh, 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 one more second, brethren. There we go. Now, <laughs> all right, one more second. Oh, that'll do. That'll do. So, very interesting little video there, isn't it? But the thing of that is, is that number one, if you if you paid attention to that, okay, the link for that video will be also in the um, in the description box. Notice that they released this on they released AIDS HIV. It was tied to those who took the vaccine for the hepatitis B, and then those who originally had gotten it seemed to have become out with the HIV. AIDS, okay? And see, in another link that I'm going to be giving in the description box, John Stockton makes the, uh, or John Stockwell, excuse me, makes the point that among the religious people that AIDS is a, is a, a wrath of God upon uh, sodomites and drug users. Well, God, is, well, for that specifically, okay, I don't believe for one second that God created AIDS, but he didn't stop it. He didn't stop it. But see, as a test run for this disease, AIDS, it went out amongst the sodomites and drug users, which to those of the New World Order, uh, to get rid of those types of people is good, onto those who want to uh, depopulate the world. They start with what? D -d -d Diseased? The sodomites, the drug addicts, the criminals, the homeless. Here in Woodstock, I've seen and I know of many homeless men who have gotten the steel of the Jesuit poniard. And they're wasting away, dying right before my eyes. A lot of similarities between the AIDS epidemic, which is still going on, and to the poison crown psychological operation. But like I said, in the one other video that I'm going to link, um, John Stockwell makes the point that, well, among the religious people, the AIDS epidemic was like, yo, praise the Lord that he sent this. God did not stop it. But I do not believe God was the author of it. I mean, he knew that it was happening, he let it happen, but no. See, that is one of those incidences where God allowed sinful man to do, to come up with one of his wicked devices to kill sinful man as for a means of judgment, yes. But God did not create AIDS. I don't believe that for one second. Not at all. Not at all. And there are those of you out there who are like, this is preposterous. People are good at their heart. Really? Really? Good people, huh? Get your authorized version of the scriptures. And turn in the authorized version of the scriptures to the beginning. Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Like I said, Church of the Living God, brothers and sisters, this video is not, not aimed at you. This is for you lost people, for you to consider. See, what they have done, what they did before in the past with AIDS, 
they're doing again. And isn't it something to note that in effect, with those who have received the steel of the Jesuit Punyard, with all the spike proteins and the um, VMAT2 inhibitors that are in uh, within the steel of the Jesuit Punyard, and all the toxins and stuff like that, is actually weakening, weakening the, immune, the immune systems of those that have received the steel of the Jesuit Punyard. So when an actual virus comes around, they're going to be dropping like flies. See? Hmm. Population control. But see, like I said, a lot of you lost people want to think that there are there's good in people, that there are good people out there. Really. Let's, let's take a look at man, shall we? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 under verse 7. Follow me along. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Note this. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 1 under verse 19, talks about the anointed cherub, who is Lucifer, Satan. Okay, was taken by his own brightness, but then every stone was his covering, his tabrets, okay, his pipes, and not tabrets, but his pipes. Um, he could he could sing or, or apparently sing, but this is talking about Satan, who was in the Garden of Eden. Okay, King Tyrus was not in the Garden of Eden. Satan was. This is talking the serpent here, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. This is Satan, okay? Just so you know, the serpent here in Genesis chapter 3 is the devil, Lucifer, Satan, okay? And he said unto the woman, the serpent said unto the woman, where's Adam? Where's the man? Not there in this context. And look at what Satan says unto the woman. It's the first thing that he says recorded in scripture, chronologically. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of the tree, not eat of every tree of the garden? So the first recorded chronological appearance of Satan was the first thing he's doing. He's questioning what? What God said. Questioning what God said. You know, you hear these Christians who say, well, the Greek says this. A better translation would be, any Bible will do. That's yea hath God said. See, they, these, these Christians, I'm not a Christian, by the way. I'm of the Church of the Living God. There's a big difference, okay? These, these Christians in these church buildings, okay? The hireling pastors, they go to the Jesuits to get a little piece of paper. They get a little piece of paper that says, see, man says, I am qualified to do this. Or, beg your pardon. The Jesuits say, I am qualified to do this. And they pay upwards to 100,000 bucks for a piece of paper that they can hang on their wall. Uh, on this channel, by the way, there's a very good video, a little dated, but very good, which has the papal keys right at the beginning of the video. Thank you, dear, dearly, dearly beloved sister, for pointing that out. Um, called The College Conspiracy. Check that out. Okay, but see, these Christians, the pastors, they go to Rome to learn what God said, and they come out with Bibles, and they come out with uh, saying, Yea, hath God said. You lost people? Listen to me. Don't trust the Christian. Oh, <gasps> yeah! Don't trust someone who's calling themselves a Christian. How you like that one, buddy? Yeah. See, because remember, Catholics, the Jesuits who are your enemy, they're Christians. And the Christians in the buildings are telling you, roll them up, take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. Okay? But the first appearance here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, he's 
Satan is, uh, number one, goes on to the woman who's by herself. Where is Adam? And he's questioning what God said. What did God say? Look directly across the page in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Okay? This is what God said. And the Lord God, uh, Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Okay? But the stipulation, the condition. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Now pay attention. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Hinge that. Okay? Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, picking up at verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, Satan, Eve said unto Satan, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. We just saw that. God said, okay, see, every, anything you, you want it, go ahead. But, you, you, you see that one tree right there? The tree of knowledge, good and evil? Don't eat it. Don't, don't eat it. You can eat whatever you want, anything you see, but not that one. And hence, the thing about sin, think about this, dear people. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay? And no marvel that his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. You know, like your health care professionals. So astute. They're doing this for your good. And they say things. <laughs> Why does it make you feel better? <laughs> Fire back at one of them that says to you, "I I need you to put on a face mask." Why is it going to make you feel better? <laughs> but okay, you've run into that, I'm sure. I'm sure. But okay, there again. The thing about sin. You can have anything you want except that one thing. Don't do that. Don't eat it or you're going to die. What does Satan do? Who, who disguises him, who is transformed as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness? That one sin, that thing that you know is sin, Satan will come and dress it up and make it look so beautiful to you. He'll make it so appealing to you, doesn't he? Think about it. Think about it. See, Hollywood people have gone way out of their way to try to tell you what Satan is not. You know, with the horns and the tail and the red and the pitchfork and no, 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 no. Satan, Lucifer, is beautiful. It's intelligent. And his ministers are ministers of righteousness. Who have your best interest in mind. Yeah. Yeah. But see. He makes sin. To be so appealing. So beautiful. So beautiful to you. But it's going to kill you. Like the analogy I've used before. Of where. Um, you know. There's all these buttons on a, on a dashboard or something. And one guy says. See that red button. Whatever you do. Don't touch the red button. And they'll have a little circle or sign on it. Don't touch the red button. What is it in you that right away, what happens? You want to touch that red button, don't you? Don't you? Why is that? Come on, you know that's true. You can like all those buttons, but that big red one, don't touch that one. There's something in you that says, well, why not? I want to touch it. That sin. Where'd that come from? Let's keep reading. Now, Eve said to Satan, yeah, we can eat anything. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Uh, neither shall you touch it. Okay? Now, but you take your, your finger there and hold it there and take your other finger and go to verse 17 in Genesis chapter 2. Okay, now look at them both side by side. For me here in my set of scriptures, it's side by side. How about you? If you got to turn the page, do so. 
but compare them. Verse 17, Genesis chapter 2. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. Here's what Eve said. Uh, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God didn't say, don't touch it. Why did, why did Eve say that? Number one, Satan came up to her. Did God really say that? Eve, by her, where, where's, where's Adam? Where's Adam? Where's Adam? Another tactic of the devil, Satan, and his ministers of righteousness. They will go after the woman. Satan will go after the woman. Why? Because the woman is supposed to be a keeper at home. <laughs> and, oh, and all you feminazis, I know that irritates you. But see, God created you to be a helpmeet unto man. Okay? Woman means of man. Okay? I know a lot of you women out there don't like that. But that's the fact. You as a woman, you are supposed to be a keeper at home. You are to be a helpmeet unto your husband if you have one. Okay? Okay? But see, a woman is supposed to be the keeper at home. So Satan going after the woman who is the keeper at home to mess up the home. Uh, yes. Okay. You feminazis, yes. A man can definitely mess up the home. Well, of course. And yes, Satan can, of course, go after a man. But the example is Satan would rather first to go after you, the woman. Because where was Adam? And because of that, out of fear, stress, who knows? Eve added to what God said. You know, in the light of Satan saying, did God really say that? Similar to Peter, who denied the Lord thrice. When the Lord said to him, you're going to deny me thrice. And Peter's like, oh, never. If anyone else does, I won't. And then he denies him three times. I never knew. I, 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 I don't. Similar. Similar. But let's, can, let's continue. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Verse 5. And here is the temptation and the bait that Satan uses for every single one of you lost people. This is, this is why you want to touch and hit the red button. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. God is the one who knows what is good and evil. And he tells us what is good and evil. How? Through his word, the authorized version of the scriptures. And see, before this, there was no sin. Man was created sinless. No sin. Man was created immortal, not to die. But here comes Satan, saying, Yea, hath God said, questioning what God said. And then in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It is God who is judge. God wants us to judge, yes, but according to the scripture, okay? Um, for example, uh, perfect hatred is basically um, being against the enemies of the Lord. Someone who is an enemy of our Lord is our enemy. Hence, perfect hatred. How do you arrive at perfect hatred? By judging through the scriptures. Okay? But see, God is judge. 
And before this, man was innocent. Didn't know, didn't need to know, um, have knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because we were originally created without sin. Perfect. But here comes Satan. Dangling that right in front of you. And what happens? You believe in uh, evolution, right? The satanic religion of evolution. Now that you see this, your eyes are open and you are your own God judging good and evil. Hmm? Yeah. You're an atheist. You say you don't believe in God, but yet you, you believe in a God, the one that you look at in the mirror because you are your own standard. You decide what is good and evil, uh, just like what Satan promised you. And hence, because of this, sin was brought into the world. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so what God said, don't touch, she, through Satan's temptation, is like, oh, I could eat that. It'd fill me up. Because her God was her belly. See, fleshly pertaining to the flesh because remember Satan is a fan of man of flesh the skin suit okay and that it was pleasant to the eyes so sin is good for the flesh and it looks beautiful Ooh. and a tree desired to make one wise your eyes will be open. You'll, you'll be your own judge. You'll be your own God. That's how sin works. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, they ate. Now see, the actual fruit itself or whatever it was is not the significant point. The point is, Satan came along and tempted Eve, who was by herself. Satan came along saying, Yea, had God, hath God said. Eve, number one, by herself, in fear, because Satan was there, uh, you know, tempting her, uh, added to the word of God. Satan lies to her. Said, you're not going to die. For God knows the minute you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God's knowing good and evil. Okay? Then she did it. And what happened? What happened? Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So see, before this, Man and woman, meaning of man, did, verse 23 in Genesis chapter 2, you feminazis. That's what woman means, okay? Read it. But, so before this, man and woman could stand butt naked in front of the Lord and not be ashamed. But see, the significance is they directly disobeyed what God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. The actual fruit or whatever it was in and of itself is insignificant compared to the fact that they disobeyed what God had said. That's the significance. Okay? Hence, this is the, what is known as the very first dispensation in the scriptures or the very first age of the scriptures. There are seven dispensations, seven ages within scripture, okay? Uh, we are right now, what? In the fifth dispensation, okay? Yes, we are in the fifth dispensation right now, okay? Because the sixth one is the time of Jacob's trouble and the seventh one is eternity. Yes, so we are in the fifth dispensation right now. So, so, this dispensation, the very first age in Scripture, was all works. All works. You'll hear that some of these people call themselves Christians and they claim to be dispensational. They're called hyper-dispensationalists. They're easy believism devil heretics. They will tell you that it was, has been faith alone, which is heresy 
you save yourself when you are saved by your own belief. Okay, but they will tell you that uh, it has been faith alone from the beginning, Genesis, unto the end of the scriptures, Revelation. Uh, well, where's faith involved with what we're looking at right now? God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, don't do that. Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, they did that. That's works. There's no faith involved. Why was there no faith involved? Because faith is the, um, uh, hold your place here, and go to Hebrews chapter 11 instead of butchering that. Hebrews chapter, hold your place there, come on. What, what is faith? What is faith? Uh, you'll hear a lot of people go all philosophical. Um, no, it's, it's a little bit more simple. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Here's the best definition of what faith is. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, just one verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's read verse 6 in Hebrews chapter 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what is faith? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Now go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. You, you idiot, idiot, uh, void of logic and reason, uh, devil, coadjutor, uh, easy believism, heretics, uh, uh, faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. See, you're, you're counting on people not searching the scriptures themselves, rather reading their Bibles and not searching the scriptures themselves. Um, you're, you're counting on people's ignorance of Scripture. Because, okay, if faith is the evidence of things not seen, things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and you guys, these easy believism devils, you know, say it's, it's faith alone in Genesis, and the very, at the very beginning, what do you do with this? Verse 8 in Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the, of the day. Hold on. How does a voice walk? How does a voice walk? Hmm? How does a how does a voice walk? Unless he has a body. You don't say. So a voice can walk if it has a body. Yeah. I like to roll that one around in your head for a little while. Okay, but. And they heard the voice of Lord God walking in the garden in the, uh, the, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now notice that does not say God the Son. We, you and I, are made in the image of God. What does that mean? We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. God has a spirit, the Holy Ghost, a soul, God the Father, a body. The Word made flesh. So God himself is spirit, soul, and body. One God. Catholics, Jesuits, you know, they tell you that God is one God comprised of three persons. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. That's what a person is. So the Catholic... Uh, with their satanic trinity. Uh, uh, wow, isn't that something for you, lost person? Uh, I'm not a Christian and I'm not a Trinitarian? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
because <laughs> Christians and Trinitarians, them are Catholics. And Catholics are uh, belong to Satan. You're Catholic? You're not saved. You're a Catholic? You're serving your father, the devil. Simply put. Okay? But now, okay, because of all this, because of all this, because our first parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God, they were hence kicked out of the garden. Okay? And because of that disobedience, that has been, that is what makes everyone born a sinner. We're born naturally, of natural birth. We have that Adamic old nature within us, meaning one that is prone to sin. That is why you are born a sinner. Okay? Go to Genesis chapter 6. Okay? Genesis chapter 6. And as a result of disobedience, okay, if you were to continue reading in Genesis, you would see the first murder, Cain and Abel. Okay? From that, this is what became of that. Here's the fruit of that disobedience. Number one, man dies. See, and the temptation was when Satan said, you shall not surely die. See, the, they were thinking right away that if they ate of the tree, that they would die immediately. You know, just like that. That was the fear, and that's a good, healthy fear. But they didn't die immediately, did they? But they did eventually die. See, it came after all an extended period of time because man was originally created to be immortal, see. So Satan said, you shall not surely die. See, Eve was thinking, it's like, if I eat that, I'm going to die like drop down dead. And God could do that. He did that to Herod. He dropped him down dead. He did that with uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, dropped him down dead. God can drop down any, um, what was his name? Uzziah, who touched the ark. Drop them down dead. God can drop you down dead if you sin just like that. But see, they didn't die just like that, which Satan was playing off of. He was playing off of that. Like these easy believers and devils play off of your people's ignorance of Scripture. And that's not your fault. Because the Christians don't want you reading Scripture. No, they want you reading in the NIV, the ESV, a Bible. They don't want you reading the Scripture. Because they say, well, the Greek says, the Greek says, a better translation, yea, hath God said. And isn't it something that all the Bibles and all these Christians, the one that they don't like the most and attack the most, is the authorized version? You as a lost person, doesn't it? And still in you, it's like, okay, why do all these Christians speak against this authorized version? What's with that? Th doesn't that spark a little uh, curiosity? I would hope so. But, okay, as a result of all of that, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 on to verse 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that is because sin was brought in from the Garden of Eden, because of man's disobedience. And man was cursed and kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and now we die, okay? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Repented. Well, what, God had to repent because he was a sinner? Shut up. Shut up. You're, you, okay, look at this verse. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth. Now look at this. And it grieved him at his heart. So grieved and repented are intrinsic, intrinsically linked in this verse. Because the repentant, God's not a sinner. God can't sin. He doesn't need to repent of anything. The repented there is that he was grieved that he made man. So, repentance 
has an element of sorrow to it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, for our Lord to save you, it's simple. You need to come to him on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness and be grieved for your sin because guess what? It's your fault that he died. See, because of Adam and Eve, we are all linked to Adam and Eve. Okay? From the long run, we come from Adam and Eve. Regardless. Okay? And because of them, thanks Adam, we're all born sinners. Okay? Children, until they reach an age where they can understand that they have sinned against God and all that stuff, um, whenever that age is, it depends on the Lord and the child, a little like an infant. Yeah, they're born sinners, but they can't know the enormity of what it means that they have sinned against God and that they're a sinner going to hell and that it's their fault. See, uh, a child... I go as far as to say um, even mid-teen can't truly grasp that. They can, of course. That's up to the Lord and to the child. But see, those who die in that state in the before the age of accountability, as it is said, um, I personally believe that they will go to heaven because they, while they're born sinners, they couldn't register it, the enormity of what that means. Okay, they couldn't. But the repented here is tied in with grief. So in order for our Lord to save you according to his terms, come to him broken of your self-righteousness that you can save yourself. See, the good person thing. That's what we're attacking here today. Sorrow, it's your fault. As it is my fault. And see, having brokenness of your self-righteousness, of your self-righteousness and having sorrow, that's going to produce in you a fear because you will realize I'm a sinner and because of this, I'm going to hell. And God is angry at the wicked every day. See, you're wicked. And that, and that realization is like, I'm wicked. I'm going to hell. That's going to, you know what that fear is? That, that's fear of the Lord. Why? Because he has every right to put you in hell. And he's just to do so. Shall not the judge of all the world do right? His ways are equal. Our ways, man's ways, are unequal. And see, that produces a fear in you. And when the fear of the Lord comes upon you and the realization that Oh, wow, I'm a sinner, a lost sinner going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. I can't save myself. I'm going to, oh, that'll cause you to call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, God our Father. Lord Jesus, save me. And maybe, hopefully, the Lord will save you. See, because it is an issue of the heart. But see, unless your heart has been broken and is contrite, our Lord wants nothing to do with a heart that isn't broken and contrite and in fear of him. And see, what these devils do, people, with their just believe. You believe this? Okay, you're saved. They're, they're stepping over their required brokenness and sorrow. And they really don't like you calling upon the name of the Lord. They call that work. Because, see, the lesser in brokenness and contrition and in fear is calling upon the greater. But, see, these devils, they're the greater because they save themselves by their own belief. And they're all against you calling upon the name of the Lord. Wicked. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, 
and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. It grieved him. See, repentance is linked with grief in that uh, context. And remember too, repent, repentance, repented, is defined by the context in which it appears. To put a blanket statement over it saying that it's um, from going from unbelief to belief, it is a turning, yes, yes. But the turning is from your self-righteousness. You got people say, well, you got to repent of your sins. Dude, you couldn't do that even at gunpoint. You couldn't do that if you tried. The repentance is turning from yourself, your self-righteousness. That's the repentance. Okay? You couldn't turn away from whatever sin it is and then go to the Lord and because you turned away and now you're clean, then he's going to say to you, no, 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 no. No, you're repenting of your self-righteousness. I'm good. My way is right. I'm going to do what I'm going to do no matter what. That's what you're repenting of. That's what you need to be broken of. Okay? And see, these easy believers and devils, they want no part of it. See, they live in the bravado of I'm saved because I just believe. Bravo there, buddy. Bravo. Bravo. You'll be frying in hell with the rest of them. But see, because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, that has fallen down through the line of man. And it says here in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And now let's go to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 under verse 22. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 under verse 22. Now God said, I'm going to destroy the earth. But in Genesis chapter 6, read verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. See, you are saved today by God's grace through faith. The name Noah means comfort. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 under verse 22. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will, not cur I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Why? For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. You're a born sinner. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Verse 21, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. You're not good. Even at your best state, you're not good. And see, and also in verse 21, he says, neither will, I, uh, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. What does that mean? By a flood. By a flood. You know, in uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 4, there are some out there who will make up this argument that the Nephilim, the giants, that somehow a strain of the giant DNA has been saved by Satan. And um, that the giant DNA is avail is around today, making you know like the uh, steel of the Jesuit poniard babies or something like that. Um, the line of Cain got extinguished in the flood. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. Okay, and there is no scriptural evidence that suggests that Noah came of a line that was infected by angels having relations with men. 
that line, that Nephilim or whatever, the giants, okay? Um, that line of Cain was extinguished in the flood. That's what I believe. And, and uh, there are several videos on this channel here where I talk about that. Um, the serpent seed doctrine is one, uh, if I'll remember, okay? But I personally believe that the line of Cain got extinguished in the flood, okay? But before the flood, the atmosphere was totally different. Uh, the air was probably a lot more oxy oxy uh, oxygenated, you know, why people grew to big heights, why people lived longer, okay? Food was a lot more healthier, okay? Remember, at our beginning, man was created both at the very least, a vegetarian, sinless and immortal. But after we got kicked out of the garden, death and born into sin and can eat meat now. What can I say? Okay. But he swore here in verse 21, and you can read about this in Genesis chapter 9, that um, he would never again destroy the earth by a flood. After the flood, we have the atmosphere and stuff that we have today. Because you can read about this in Genesis, uh, I forget where it is, um, about Ham's sin. Okay? Ham's sin. And you got these devils out there who say, they want to tell you that there was a sexual element involved in that. That's nonsense. There was no sexual element involved in the Ham's sin. No, it's that he saw his father naked and he mocked him. And then he went and told his brethren without and said, hey, look at our father. Ha, 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 ha. That was Ham's sin. Okay? But see, after the flood, grapes fermented more quickly. So Noah was able to get drunk. Things changed after the flood. The atmosphere and all that. And, and the Grand Canyon, for example, was probably made in a couple of minutes. Not millions and millions of years ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay? But he promised that he would never destroy the earth as he did with a flood. He's going to destroy the earth again by fire, but not by a flood. But the main point that we're looking at is for in verse 21 in Genesis chapter 8. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. From his youth. Okay. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 on to verse 19. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. S these six Thing, six, the number of man. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to run into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among Brethren, and this you see in these who uh, try to worm their way into the church of the living God and are there just to cause division and strife and stuff like that. But as you can see from verses 16 on to verse 19, that's talking about lost sinners. There's a difference between a lost sinner and a saved sinner. And see, this is the byproduct of... Of being of having wicked imaginations from your youth, okay. You're born a sinner, and as you grow older, unless you are taught otherwise, you're going to keep growing and thinking yourself a good person, and uh, gratifying your own flesh, and living these six things, yea, seven that are an abomination unto our Lord. See, this is man at his best state. And see, because man has fallen, because this is what man is, what happens when men 
get together. You hear a lot about we're all in this together. And Catholicism, through ecumenicalism, wants to bring everybody together. What happens when men get together? Go back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. See, Roman Catholicism is implementing this thing called the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement is getting every faith that there is under heaven together under the headship of Roman Catholicism. And they use things like easy believism, the God loves you, God's love is unconditional, love the sinner, hate the sin. God, God, yeah, yeah, God loves everybody, okay? Preaching the love gospel. God loves you, okay? That's ecumenicalism, bringing everybody together. God wants people to be separate, okay? Because what happens when man gets together? See, Roman Catholicism, they want everyone to come together. You're hearing that we're all in this together. Bring the world together. What happens when man gets together like that? Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 9. Here's what happens when good men get together. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to... Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let us make us a name. First, let us make us a tower that reacheth unto heaven. The implication is, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Like I told you, Church of the Living God, this video is not primarily for you. Okay? This is for these lost people. Okay? Genesis chapter... Uh, Genesis. Isaiah chapter 14. Verses 12 on to verse 15. This right here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, this is where this comes from. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? What does Lucifer mean? Son of the morning, not the morning star, which your Bibles tell you. The morning star is a title attributed to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bright and shining morning star. See, the Bibles tell you that this right here in verse 12 is Jesus Christ who gets kicked out of heaven. Yeah, check an NIV, check an ESV, check a New American Standard. Uh, Lucifer isn't there. It says morning star. Yeah. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken nations? Lucifer. You know, the ones who the Freemasons worship? Satan. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five is the number of death, by the way. So, I will, 
I will be like the Most High. I will. I will. Genesis 11, verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. I will be like the Most High. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Lest we be scattered. Make us a name. I will be like the Most High. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. So see, when man gets together, they make to themselves towers that reach up to heavens because they want to be just like God. And see, Catholicism wanting to bring everybody together, it's so that they can worship that man of sin, the son of perdition. But first they got to get rid of all these too many people because less people, easier to control. They did so with the man-made disease called AIDS. Before that, the man-made disease, polio. And now a manufactured psychological operation called the poison crown. I smell something. How about you? What happens? What does the Lord do about this? Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. See, when everybody can understand each other, and everybody can talk to each other and whatnot, when everyone was of one speech, what happened? They got together, built themselves a tower to reach unto heaven because they want to be gods. And make themselves a name. Okay. And the Lord is acknowledging this. Look at this though. And the Lord said. Behold the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them. Which they have imagined to do. Think about that. God is saying there. When men get together. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. And every imagination of man's heart is only evil continually? Think about that. When men get together, they create diseases, viruses like AIDS. When men get together, they make weapons like the atom bomb or the nuclear bomb. Radioactive fleas. When man gets together, they can play God and make food, genetically modified organisms, and make food to play God and mix these uh, species with species, hence creating toxic food. When men get together, they can play God and using eugenics and make designer babies. Make babies in a test tube where man can decide what kind of skin color, what kind of eye color, what kind of hair color, whether it's a boy or a girl. See, when man gets together, what is the, what our, this is what God said himself. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Wicked Jesuit minds that come up with the nuclear bomb, the atom bomb. Wicked, depraved Jesuit minds that come up with AIDS and polio, poison crown. See, when men get together, go to. Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. He did not destroy Babylon. They just didn't finish it. Very important to note that. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound 
the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. God is a God of distinction. God of a, is a God of separation. God loves variety. Okay? We're all made in the image of God. We have a spirit, soul, and body. But you and I are different. Okay? You and I are different. There are birds, but there are different kinds of birds. There are dogs, and there are different kinds of dogs. There are horses, and there are different kinds of horses. Okay? There is man, and there are different kinds of man. And God wants you here, you there, you there, you there, you right here. He wants separation. See, because when man integrates and gets together like this, this is what happens. And that is exactly what Roman Catholicism wants to happen, to bring everyone together so that man can build themselves a temple <laughs> to reach unto heaven, so they can be as gods. That's man for you, people. And you think you're a good person, huh? You, we, we have this working against us. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Verses 21 on to verse 26. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings upon, unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out to the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice. And I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. But they hearken not. Why is that? Because man's uh, heart, because man is evil. Every imagination of his heart is evil. Only evil continually. His heart is evil from his youth. You're born a sinner. That's why. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imaginations of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. The new world order that you hear so much about is not a new world order. It's a return to the dark ages when Roman Catholicism ruled everything. So see, the goal is not to go forward, people. It's to go backward. We were free. Had freedom. But now freedom is being taken away. We're going backward, not forward, you wicked evolutionists. Okay? Evolution is insane. It's, it's a religion of Satan. Okay? Man is not getting progressively better. Man is getting worse. We're going backward, not forward, people. 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. What's going on today, the people of today, the generations of today, would make generations of 30 years ago shriek in, ho, 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 in terror. So those of today have not done what their wicked fathers did 30 years ago. <laughs> and you want to tell me man's getting better? <laughs> Keep, keep smoking that stuff there, buddy boy. <laughs> yeah. Up the dosage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 3 on to verse 16. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. 
but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. <laughs> Hello, people. Lost person? You're not valiant for the truth? You want to believe what the Jesuits tell you about what's going on today? You call evil good and good evil? To you, yeah, the authorized version of the scriptures is evil. Why do you say that? Because of these Christians make what is the true faith look abhorrent unto you because you are seeing what is false. Never trust a Christian. Oh, yeah, that's right. Never trust a Christian. What is a Christian? Catholic? Your non-denominational people? Lutherans? Who are Catholics? They don't like that when you call them Catholics, by the way. <laughs> Methodists? What about Baptists? Fine Christians, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never trust a Christian there, dear friend. Church of the Living God? This you can trust. And see, only the Jesuits, the devil, want you not to trust this, the authorized version. They say, Yea, hath God said. That's what Satan says. And their Yea, hath God said is the NIV, the ESV, the New American Standard. Okay? And some of these so-called Jewish translations like Stern's, the complete Jewish Bible, and that one that I looked into, I, I don't even remember, by some other twit guy. <laughs> See, the Bibles come from Rome. The scriptures come from God. Okay? So, hey, yeah, you Catholics, you did give people the Bible. God gave us the scriptures. And because of all this, because man is so evil and doesn't want to acknowledge God, but wants to go to the instruments of a foolish shepherd. Verse 4 in Jeremiah chapter 9. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in, in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Like if you read uh, Orwell's 1984 about how people are snitching on each other. It's getting to that point now. And they will deceive every one his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and wearied themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Through deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart, but in heart he layeth his weight. Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. Shall I not visit them for these things? Saith the Lord, God is a God of judgment. Yes, God is going to visit for these things. God is a God of judgment, people. You have to understand that. Okay? Okay. Perfect hatred requires judgment. How do you judge according to the scriptures? What do you think? How do you think the Lord is going to judge us, huh? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? For the mountains will I, for the mountains will I take up a weeping and wailing. And for the habitations of the wilderness, a lamentation, because they are burned up, so that none can pass through them. Neither can men hear the voice of the cattle. 
Both the fowl of the heavens and the beast are fled. They are gone. And I will make Jerusalem heaps, a den of dragons. 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 Oh, similar to that old serpent, the devil, the dragon, the red dragon, Satan. You know, one that speaks like a dragon, speaks like Satan, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. You know, itch your ears, tell you what. See, a devil tells you what you want to hear. When someone is, who is of the church of the living God tells you what you need to hear. It's a big difference. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Who is the wise man? that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken, that he may declare it? For what the land for what the land perisheth and is burned up like wait wait a minute. For what the land perisheth and is burned up like a wilderness that none passeth through? And the Lord saith, Because they have forsaken my law which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein. But have walked after the imagination of their own hearts and after Balim, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. Yeah, the result of what happened in the Garden of Eden. A result of that. And man is getting worse, not better. See, man is deteriorating and breaking down, not getting better. What we're looking at in and of itself totally disproves evolution. Isaiah chapter 1, just two verses. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And, and think about the Jesuit-controlled um, Medical industry, the doctors controlled by the Jesuits. There's no money in the cure, people. They're not out to cure you. They're out there to treat symptoms, not to cure, and to get you dependent on their poison, their sorcery, their pharmacia, their witchcraft, pharmaceutical drugs. There ain't no money in the cure. Because if man, we saw when man gets together, nothing will be restrained from them. What they imagine to do. You want me to believe that man, through the Lord, through natural means, you want to tell me that man, through uh, work of the Lord, couldn't find a cure for cancer? You want to tell me that man... Through the Lord, or the Lord through man, I should, should say, excuse me, um, don't have a cure for AIDS? You want to tell me that God who said, when man gets together, whatever they imagine to do, they can do, okay? You want to tell me if man gets together, they couldn't get, uh, through the Lord, of course, you know, through natural means, that's what I mean, couldn't find a cure? For this stuff that's going on today. But see, no, brethren, people, there ain't no money in the cure, is there? 
And this is all a result of good man. Psalm 39. It's pretty bleak. You're not a good person. You are your best state. It's altogether vanity. See, you need to be broken of that self-righteousness of yours, dear friend. Psalm 39, verses 4 on to verse 8. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. See, you lost people, you think you're so tough, you're so strong, man's getting better, you've fallen for the lie of evolution. Here's a contrite, humble heart here. Lord, make me to know mine end. Not just how you're going to die, where are you going to go, buddy boy? I hope the Lord uh, wakes you up to let you know you're going to hell. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as in hand breath and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Shalah. Vanity at your best. Your vanity. Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. Man is like a fleeting player, a vain shoe, who dances and struts his stuff upon a stage only to be heard of no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's a gross paraphrase of William Shakespeare's Macbeth. But see, you're here for a little while, and you're full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, huh? You, you still ain't not, never read no Shakespeare, right? What's wrong with you? Oh, yeah, you read Shakespeare, but in modern English, right? <laughs> yeah. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. See, people, you gotta, you got to be brought to that place where it's like, Lord, <laughs> and now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. See, while, while you still thinking that, okay, you're going to go to the government, you're going to go to this, you're going to go to that, you're going to go to the instruments of a foolish shepherd. You ain't broken. You need to go to the Lord, but you need to go on his terms. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Verses 18 on to verse 32. A lost person. This is talking about you. This is about you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that, which was, that, because that which may be known of God and is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. What does that mean? Uh, this, you, you look at a leaf, this, you think this happened by millions and billions of years in a galaxy far, far away. No, no, God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. God created everything. Okay, You are made in the image of God. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. Okay, that's the image of God. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. Okay? God has shewed that to you. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Look outside your door. That didn't happen by random chance. You numbskull. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is the Godhead? Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? That's what the Godhead is. We are made in the image of God. We are not God himself, no, but we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. See, he's referring to that fact right there in verse 20 about, you know, and by, by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. That did not evolve from nothing over millions and billions of years. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. That is not something that has evolved. That is something that was created by God. Okay? Because that when they knew God, just here, you know, like these easy believism devils, they, they know God up here. They glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. There's that imaginations again. And their foolish hearts, and their foolish heart was darkened. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So, they knew God just here, just up here, like all these easy believism devils do. They know of God up here, but it doesn't trans, you know, go down to the 18 inches and that kind of stuff, okay? They glorified him not as God. How do they not, how do they do that? They don't glorify him as God because they don't call upon him. No, they save themselves, see? See, you're not glorifying God as God there, you wicked devil. No, because you save yourself. And then you preach against calling upon the name of the Lord. That's a work. That's a work. No, no. That's the result of someone who is broken in contrition and fears the Lord. And that's in accordance with Scripture. But see, when you save yourself by your own belief, preaching the love gospel, everybody loves you. Yeah, God loves you. Everyone, yeah, let's all get together and hug and kiss and yeah. Got to be careful. Don't trust a Christian there, lost person. Don't trust a Christian. Verse 22. Uh, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, as if they had to the fear of the Lord, they became fools who say in their heart, there is no God. Wisdom, wise, is equated with the fear of the Lord. So they profess themselves, professing themselves to be wise, that they have the fear of the Lord. But yet, they glorified him not as God. They became fools. And the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, verses uh, 18 on to verse 22 specifically, uh, really speaks against these easy believism devils. But we're not done. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible Man, I will be like the Most High, worshiping man. And to birds, the third member of the Satanic Trinity, and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Why? Because you're lusting after man. Remember, sin. Satan will make sin to look so beautiful. Yeah, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Hey, you female sodomites, lesbians, who are aware what it says in Leviticus about how Man will not lay with mankind. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. Never. Female sodomite, a lesbian, said that to me the one time. 
said, it says that man will not lay with mankind. I'm not a man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you're, you're a lesbian. Um, verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's talking about you. And likewise also the men. Leaving the natural use of the woman. Burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. AIDS? Like I said, God could have stopped AIDS. Yes, he could have. Did he create AIDS? I don't believe so. Did God use, allow AIDS to infect sodomites and to kill sodomites and drug addicts? Yes. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. And remember, I believe they created AIDS as a means to depopulation, starting with the undesirables as the global elites like to uh, talk about. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What happens when someone has been given over to a reprobate mind? Okay, uh, And incidentally, um, the reprobate doctrine is heresy, Anybody can be saved. Someone who crosses a line where they, uh, you know, where they make their choice to serve Satan. It's not that God can't save them. It's that they have chosen to serve Satan. I know of many people like that. Many, unfortunately, who have chosen Satan. And pretend to be of the church of the living God. But rather they're Christians. When someone makes a choice to serve Satan. And gives themselves over onto that. Um, they're gone. God could save them. Yes he can. But if someone has given themselves over onto Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Unless a miracle happened. Unless God's judgment be upon them and break them, they're, they're a lost cause. But this reprobate doctrine that you've heard of, taught by the new IFB and stuff like that, that people who were sodomites uh, can't be saved, guess what? Guess what? I was once a sodomite myself. And here I am. I'm a saved man. See, Stephen Anderson is, promotes the uh, reprobate doctrine because he himself is a sodomite. Hey, you tell Stephen Anderson that I said so. Hey, Mr. Anderson, you're a sodomite. And here are the um, fruits of someone who has made their choice. Being filled with all uncleanness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, <laughs> backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, departing from evil, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them, because misery loves company. Right? Hey, lost person, this is you. This is you. You're a lost sinner. I am a saved sinner. There's a difference. Okay? But this is you. This is you. You want to hear a little bit more about you? Okay? Romans chapter 2, verses 1 unto verse 11. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Well, that means we mustn't judge people. Ugh. Judgment comes from God. 
True judgment comes from God. We are to judge things according to the scripture. But when you got a lost person judging a lost person, eh, that's what that's talking about. See, we as the church of the living God who have Christ in us, the circumcision made without hands, you know, the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit. Um, we are to judge according to the standard of scripture, beginning with ourselves and you too, against you too, okay? But see, when someone who has not God is judging those people who himself is lost of those people, eh, That's what that's talking about. Okay, let's continue. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance and note it says long suffering not patience there's a difference but after thy hardness and impentient heart impentient not willing to bow that knee to bend that knee treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God See, you're not willing to bend, you're not willing to humble yourself because you got a hard heart. Hmm? Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. God's love is not for you unless you go to Calvary. You reject that, you're a child of wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, to the, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. So it doesn't matter if it's someone who keeps the law. Or someone who doesn't. All are under sin. But that includes you personally. Now go to Romans chapter 3. We're going to begin at verses 10. And we're going to read under verse 28. See now the easy believism heretic will tell you that the pure gospel is verses 23 on to uh, verse 26. But see, we're going to read what they won't tell you. Because Romans chapter 3, where we're beginning, is meant for you, lost person, to break you of that self-righteousness you have. And we already kind of looked at this a little bit. So, let's continue. Uh, Romans 3, verses 10 on to verse 28. Hey, you easy believers and devils, you've never been used of our Lord to bring someone onto himself through the Romans road. You never have. Don't tell me you have. It's obvious you haven't. Because this is what you do when the Lord uses you to bring someone on to himself, when you have the privilege to be used of our Lord for that, this is how he will bring someone on to himself. When using the Romans road and using a vessel that is meant for his use. You've never done this. I know, it shows. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 under verse 28. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. That includes you. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That includes you. 
They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That includes you. My mother who is in hell, she couldn't get past this one. She could not. She stumbled at this. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Why? There is no fear of God before their eyes. So see, up to that point, okay, we've looked in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 about our God, our Lord Jesus Christ telling you of your condition. You're a sinner. And you're not good. You're not good. Why is that? Because there is no fear of God before your eyes. But now, let's continue. Now we know that what the thing, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, the law of Moses, the Levitical law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That's there to tell you that what that you know that's God's perfect requirements and standards. But see, man at his best state is altogether vanity. You couldn't do that, you couldn't keep the law perfectly uh, uh, even if you tried. If you keep one but break another, you've broken the whole thing. So the law was there. For what? For by the law is the knowledge of sin to make you aware of sin. That also to make you aware of, guess what there, cousin? You can't save yourself. Even by your own uh, even by your own belief. Crazy. Okay, let's continue. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, upon all and upon unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. This is your answer to your problem. For all have sinned, including you, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that might that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where it now, okay, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. See, you got some out there who are religious will come up to you and say, it's like, well, you got to keep the law of Moses. You got to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. No. No. That's there to show us that we're sinners to need to be saved. But see... Romans 1 and Romans 2, what we looked at, shows you of your lost condition. That's you, lost person. And here, uh, verses 10 on to verse 18, that's also you. There's no hope for you. Here is your hope. But see, we're not done yet. See, we're not done yet. Now let's read Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Go to Psalm. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. One verse. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, 
Thou wilt not despise. That's the purpose of verses 10 on to verse 18. To break your heart. Yeah, that proud, stubborn, not willing to yield, not willing to bend the heart of yours, full of yourself. Okay? Now go to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 on to verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made. And all the things, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Verses 43 on to verse 44. And there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein ye have been defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. There's none righteous, no, not one. You're not good. You at your best state are, is altogether vanity. You worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Not according to your ways, not according to what you think. No, but by, what does that say in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 26? Do declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be the be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. See, these easy believism people cut out all of this from verses 10 all the way up to verse 22 or up to at least verse uh, 21. Okay? They cut that out and just concentrate on these select verses to twist that so you save yourself by your own belief. Excluding brokenness and contrition. See? But see what you got to remember, dear friend. What you cannot forget. What you cannot ever forget. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. One verse. See, where here it says, verse 23 in Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, everybody's a sinner. See, making themselves of the whole. But see, salvation is personal. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And that's it right there, buddy boy. That's it. Of whom I am chief. See, salvation is personal. See, you... You can try to hide yourself under the blanket that, well, everybody's a sinner, but what about you? Well, well it says that, we're all saying, yeah, but what about you personally? Every single time I've, I've met people having this conversation, you know what happens? Sooner or later, it comes to, well, I'm not as bad as, I haven't done as. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. See, salvation is personal. That's why these easy believers and heretics and those who preach the love gospel don't have it because it's not personal to them. It's not real because they're not saved. Acts 
And you know, it talks about uh, in verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Hmm. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. One verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both father of uh, both soul and body in hell. So see, he's saying this to fear him. Who is that him? Did these Catholic Trinitarians that say God the Father? God the Father, not God the Son. Really? Uh, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Verses 9 on to verse 11. Um, by the way, those of you who get left behind, these easy believism devils and these devils preaching the love gospel, uh, they want you to get left behind to take the mark of the beast so you can be damned to hell. I'll prove that to you. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 on to verse 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire, look at this, and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're going to be tormented in the presence of his only angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In front of God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Whosoever. And it says here. In verse 9, if any man worship the beast, that means uh, taking the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead. And whosoever, whosoever, right there in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's the mark that's in your right hand or in your forehead, which these devils want you to get. And what all this stuff is leading on to. Okay? But also go to Mark, uh, Mark, Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 and verse 13. Now, if you have a set of scriptures that have red words, this is Jesus talking. Revelation 22, verses 12 on to verse 13. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So when our Lord says, fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell, um, he's saying, you better be afraid of me, because Jesus is the Father. Read John chapter 14 sometime, okay? Jesus plainly calls himself the Father. Read John chapter 4. He plainly referred to himself as the Messiah, okay? He's saying, you better fear me. And what happens? What happens if you want to reject all of this? Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 43, unto the close of the chapter. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life than having two hands to go into hell, into, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Never shall be quenched. See, you've got people who tell you that your soul will be annihilated. He says to destroy both body and soul in hell, but not to be annihilated. You're going to burn forever. Where their worm dieth not, nor the fire is not quenched. 
And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So, if your hand offend thee, cut it off. What does that mean? Literally? That doesn't mean during the time of Jacob's trouble, you can cut it off and be saved. No, you get the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, you're done. Okay? You're done. Uh, unlike what uh, some people say, you can cut it off or gouge it out. No, once you take that, you're done because it will make you into someone else. Kind of like what the steel of the Jesuit Ponyard has done to people today. Okay? But what are you touching with your hands? Cut it off. Don't do that anymore. Not literally cut it off, but repent of it. If your feet, where, where are your feet leading you? Don't go there. Cut it off. Turn away from sins. Okay? Verse 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. What are you putting before your eyes? What are you looking at? Don't look at it anymore. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. So see, if you don't come to our Lord on these conditions, being broken and contrite, knowing that you're not good, knowing that you deserve to go to hell. You deserve to go there, friend. If you don't come to him on his terms, but see, if you just believe and go up some other way, you're a thief and a robber. You're not saved. You're not saved. Now go to Romans chapter 7. Uh, Romans chapter 7, excuse me. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 7. You heard what your solution to your problem is. You heard what your problem is. You heard what the solution is in Romans chapter 3. But how do you go about getting that? How do you go about arriving to that? Romans chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 7. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found... For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And that work there is being referenced unto the works of the law. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Whose sins are covered. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, under verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 under verse 10. 
For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. See, when you just believe without coming to our Lord broken of your self-righteousness and fear and uh, contrite and in fear of the Lord, don't call upon him, but go up some other way. You're saving yourself. God's grace through faith is not there. You're still in your sins. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, and the works there is being referenced to the works of the law, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on to good works after salvation, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 on to verse 11. And we already looked at what faith is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, by grace, through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh... <sighs> Patience uh, and patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. See, unless you're saved, born again, converted, you don't have the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is that Spirit, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. That is the circumcision made without hands, okay? So only those who are truly saved have the Holy Ghost. For we, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, God's love toward us. Who is the toward us? Those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. His body. His love. But God commendeth his love toward us. Those who are saved. Okay? We are his ambassadors telling you how the Lord can save you. Okay? His love toward us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, it's personal. It's personal. Christ died for us. For me. Not this Calvinism, elect and non-elect nonsense. No. Christ died for me personally. You know why? Because it was my fault that he died and went to the cross and shed his blood. It's my fault. It's your fault. Can you have you been, have you been brought to that yet, or are you like Saul? Uh, yeah, okay, it's my fault. But this guy made me do this. This guy did this. That that's why you, you're not you're not broken yet. You're not broken that. You're not. You're not broken. You're not broken. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Because God hath not appointed us to, unto wrath, but to obtain salvation, being caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? For if when we were yet enemies, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So 
So what do you do now? Hmm? You've heard the indictment against you. You've heard the answer. What do you do now? What do you do now? You wicked devils. You easy believers and devils. You've never been here before. But to you lost people, what do you do now? Do you want to know? Romans chapter 10. Are you tired of this? Hmm. You want to be with our Lord Jesus Christ? He's the only one who can save you. He's the only one who can make things right in your life. That doesn't mean that he'll save you from uh, circumstances within your life. But see, when you die, you know how we looked about hell? You won't go there. That's where they're going. You don't want to go there? You Do you want to go to hell? Oh, are you going to be one of these? Well, I don't believe in hell. <laughs> uh, yeah. You've heard what the answer is. How do you, how, okay, you've heard your answer. You've heard the solution. What do you do? Romans chapter 10, verses 4 on to verse 13. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all them, all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this, of course, is mentioned in Joel, which the easy believism uh, heretic will like to point out to you. And they say, well, see, this proves it is for the Jews. No, this proves that it crosses dispensational lines. Okay? Calling upon the name of the Lord. And you arrive to that point of calling upon the name of the Lord, as we've already looked at, by being broken of your self-righteousness and having godly sorrow for the fact that Christ died for you, for an ungodly sinner. And the fear of going to hell, fear that you're going to stand before a just and righteous God who has every right to send you there, that ought to scare the hell out of you. Call upon his name. Ask him, save me, Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've come to him on his conditions, which is not that difficult, it's very easy actually, and he save you, once he does save you, if he does, if you come to him on his conditions, on his terms, then this happens. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 on to verse 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because, go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. If the Lord truly save you, you come to him on his terms. Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 on to verse 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Look at verse 20. Hold your place here and go to Ephesians chapter 1. What does this mean? Christ lives within you. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 12, uh, verses 12 on to verse 14. That we should be of, uh, verses 12 on to verse 14 in Ephesians chapter 1. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the with that holy spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption the catching away of the body of christ before the time of jacob's trouble until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory sealed unto the day of redemption that means eternally secure once saved always saved when you come to the Lord on his terms, and we looked at his terms, okay? We looked at it. You come to him on his terms. And you call upon his name in brokenness, contrition, and fear of the Lord, and he save you. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are sealed until the day of redemption. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The Holy Spirit of promise. And Jesus is the Father. So you have got the Father living within you. Look at that verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Dear friend, you got someone coming to you saying, just believe, just believe, just believe. Without, without using the sword of the Spirit to cut you down to pieces and to hack you to bits. You're dealing with a Christian. You're not, you're not meeting anyone of the church of the living God who is a representative of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. You got someone preaching to you, God loves you. You're dealing with a Christian. You're not dealing with someone who is of the church of the living God. You know, I, I forget if I already said this to you, so I'm going to say it again. You know, before I uh, started this video, I um, went to the Walmart in town here. The uh, food shortage is beginning. You hear all over the news right now. Well, not all, all over the news.
news, but uh, when I've heard and listened to the news, talking about the supply line thing, and we're seeing it in the grocery store. I've been, ta told, I've been telling you about this. Now it's happening. People, some really evil times are coming. And the Jesuit order is behind it. This video was made in the premise it was made so that, number one, I mean, it. <laughs> meeting people was like, uh, the government didn't create anything like that. It just happened. And then you got people saying, oh, when, with like AIDS, attributing it to like God's wrath and whatnot. God allowed it. But you, you'll see the video that I linked about how um, they're trying to vilify Christ by those who are cheering these things. Hmm. We are to praise the Lord for his righteous judgment upon the wicked. We praise him for his righteous judgment. Not that the fact that that wicked person was killed. That is wicked. But we are to rejoice in God's judgment. Because shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It's going to be it for this video. Hopefully, um, hopefully this helps come, uh, a few of you. Can't make it any more plainer than this. Because there's going to come a time when you're not going to be able to hear anything like this. Come to the Lord now before it's too late. That's going to be it. Thank you so much for watching this video, if you do. And um, again, thank you unto the Church of the Living God, the body of Christ, our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for all that you have done. We love you. And thank you for, for what you have done. Um, please keep us in your prayers. Things are getting... Uh, <laughs> things are getting sticky around here. So. Thank you. We love you. I'll see you in the next video.